Hey there, and welcome back to Englishes Around the World. Today will be a little more serious than usual, because when we discuss varieties of English around the world, we cannot really address that topic without talking about colonialism and how colonialism has had consequences not only for language, but also for people. When we study world Englishes, we don't just study linguistic structures or pronunciations or words. If we want to really understand that topic, we need to engage with the history of English as a world language, and many aspects of that history have been shaped by colonialism, that is, by violence and by unspeakable suffering that was inflicted by people who were using the English language, often for political purposes. It's maybe tempting to think that the days of colonialism are over and that everyone nowadays agrees that enslaving human beings and taking away their resources is wrong. But unfortunately, that would be missing the point that the consequences of colonialism are still very much present in the world that we're living in. The social disadvantages that colonialism has created persist for generations And also, many of the ideas that fueled colonialism, the racist ideologies that were used as false justifications, they are still with us. Now, before we start, let me just briefly state three points. First, my knowledge of colonialism is exclusively from books, not from experience. Second, I have never experienced discrimination because of the color of my skin or the features of my face. And third, I've had advantages in life that are indirectly but ultimately based on the labor and resources of men, women and children that were exploited during colonial times. What this means is that really it should be my role to listen and be educated by others rather than sit here in my office lecturing. And because of that, I would ask you to let me know if I say anything in this video that is inaccurate or ignorant or thoughtless. Yeah, I'll be grateful for your input. Please let me know in the comments. I'd like to start this video with a picture of my university, the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. This is the building that I work in, and you see that the address is Espace Tilofre. On the right, you see a photograph of Thilo Frey, and uh, she was a Swiss college teacher and politician. She was actually the first female member of the Grand Conseil de Neuchâtel, the regional parliament, and she was the first person of color to be elected to the Swiss Nationalrat, that is the Swiss National Parliament. In her political work, she was an outspoken advocate of civic rights, and it is fitting that her name marks the address of a university faculty of humanities and social sciences. What you also see in this picture is that our university address was not always Espace Tilofre. Just until last year, 2019, it used to be Espace Louis Agassi. Louis Agassi was a 19th century Swiss biologist and geologist who ultimately became a professor at Harvard in the United States in the 1840s. Now, why was Agassiz's name taken down? In his writings, Agassiz explicitly argued for what is today known as white supremacy. Agassiz visited plantations in South Carolina and he took photographs of enslaved people and he was using his status as a recognized scientist to put forward views that were then used to justify slavery and segregation. Now, I'm speaking personally here. As a scientist, I find that misusing science, science, yeah, for the purpose of justifying harm done to other human beings, that's a special kind of evil that I personally find hard to forgive. Yeah, the job of scientists is to make life better for everyone. And here, Agassi, I would say, has failed his professional ethics. He did the opposite. He provided the pseudo-scientific mindset that fueled the persistence of racism. Now, when the name was changed, of course, there was a big discussion. Of course, there were voices arguing that, well, his racism was not that big of a deal. Yeah, come on. It was the 19th century. 
that was okay back then. Well, I disagree. Yeah, What this kind of mindset shows is that crimes of the past are simply not recognized as such and the consequences of colonialism are allowed to persist unchecked. Yeah, So it's okay to have a museum in Berlin that's full of Egyptian stuff. Yeah, It's been so long ago that we took it, we might as well keep it. Let's not talk about it. Now, one of my personal many privileges is that I can ignore racism for a day or two if I feel overwhelmed. Yeah, The men, women and children who are the target of racism, they don't have that luxury. So with all of this in mind, uh, let's get started. In this video, I want to cover three issues. First of all, I'll outline a few basic notions that we're dealing with when we're talking about colonialism. The second part of this video creates the link between history and language. So we'll look at four different types of colonies and we'll be looking at the linguistic developments that are typical for those colony types. The third part then brings us back to the topic of language teaching and specifically the teaching of English in colonial settings. What I'll have to say in this video is based in part on uh, chapter 3 of Edgar Schneider's book English Around the World and in a couple of places I relied on other resources and I point that out in those parts of the video. Okay, so let's get started with the first part. What is colonialism? It's instructive to start with a world map that shows countries in which English has a special status, either as an official language or as a lingua franca or in the shape of a pidgin or creole. The map makes a very simple point. English is everywhere. How did it get there? Colonialism is a big part of the answer. Now, as a first approximation, what I want to focus on in this video are events that can be broadly situated between the 1500s and the early 1900s, when European countries used force to establish settlements in overseas areas where they took political and economical control. A defining feature of colonialism is that the colonizers form a ruling class that has power over the indigenous population. The indigenous people, their labor and their natural, agricultural and industrial resources are exploited economically for the benefit of what is called the metropolis, the country of the colonizers. That means the most important factor driving colonialism is money, yeah? access to people that are enslaved, access to natural and agricultural resources. Another economical factor is control over trade routes and markets so that you can either impose tariffs on others or you can avoid tariffs that others would impose on you if you were to cross their land. Now, what's uncontroversial is that colonialism has a devastating economical impact on the colonies. It drains them. But recently, it has been argued that colonial expansion has also been costly for the imperial countries themselves, so that the money that went into colonization would have been more profitably spent elsewhere. It's being debated how colonialism may have negatively affected taxpayers in the metropolis, but what is again uncontroversial is that private companies who were involved in the colonial trade made staggering profits. Now, not all factors that drove colonialism were purely economic. There were also political factors, among them rising nationalism and increasing competition between European powers. There are further technological factors that made colonialism possible in the first place. And last not least, there are philosophical factors that justified the enterprise. Colonialism, you could say, was driven by white supremacy, which wasn't called that at the time, but which is clearly recognizable as such. Parts of colonial ideology were the representation of non-European cultures as deficient, so difference was seen as a shortcoming. This concerns, for example, oral culture as opposed to writing, non-sedentary agriculture where people move around instead of staying in one place, and of course, difference in religion. It's always our God and their brute superstition. 
And don't get me started on pseudoscientific justifications for European colonialism. Social Darwinism is one example, measuring skulls, the science of phrenology. In fact, let's go back for a minute to my university and let's examine some of the things that Louis Agassiz put in writing on the topic of the diversity of origin of the human races. Agassiz is arguing here for the position that different groups of humans evolved independently. Today, of course, we have genetic evidence that disproves the idea. So all of our ancestors we now know come from Africa. And in science, there is no shame in being factually wrong. But in this paper, something else is going on. Agassiz rhetorically links difference to hierarchy. And very surprisingly, a white man concludes that white people are superior to everyone else. Who would have thought? Yeah. Um, you can read the relevant passages for yourself. I'll put a link in the description below, but I won't read them here. Now, Agassiz did not personally enslave people, but his views were of the kind that allowed a discourse to persist that justified and rationalized exploitation, abuse and killing. This slide here shows a disturbing infographic on the ships that crossed the Atlantic Ocean with people who were abducted from Africa and brought to the Caribbean, to Brazil and to North America. A link again is in the description below. Let me briefly bring all of this back to language. One aspect that makes it difficult to talk about colonialism is the fact that many of the terms that are used are in fact euphemisms that have been coined in order to present colonialism in positive terms. I've put four examples on this slide, namely mother country, age of discovery, plantation and landowners. Now on the surface of things, these words may seem innocent or at least not that bad. Now, I would like you to pause this video and take a brief thinking break. Why do you think I singled out these words? What exactly is euphemistic about them? And uh, what would be adequate labels for the notions that are described by these words? If you want to do this, take five minutes, write down a few thoughts, and then come back to the video. I'll continue in three, two, one. Here we go. So the term mother country evokes the idea of a nurturing parent. The colony is framed as the child and by implication the indigenous population is presented as childlike, yeah? naive, irresponsible, incapable of looking after themselves. You know, you, you need to take care of them and you're practically doing them a favor if you bring order to the colony. That's what this word implies. The age of discovery, well, if you discover something, that implies that you're the first to see it. And if you think about it, that's not really true of countries that are already populated. Plantation. Well, a plantation that almost sounds like it's a nice farm, you know, things grow and uh, it's a green, wonderful place. Well, it's not. It's literally a death camp. Landowners, they took a piece of land that belonged to someone else in the first place. If you think about it, also the term slave, which is all over the place in discussions of colonialism, that's a dehumanizing term because it reduces the enslaved people to their role as a commodity. Yeah? Those are men, women and children and not just slaves. Slave that is the role that they happen to find themselves in, against their will, of course. Now, colonialism may seem like a long time ago, but here's a map that is just 100 years old, so to speak, and that shows the extent of the British Empire in the 1920s. As you can see, British colonialism affected the entire planet. It was, however, on its way out. Um, World War II can be seen as a turning point in the history of European colonialism because it caused a loosening of the ties between Britain and its colonies. The financial resources that Britain had to put into the war 
was no longer available to fund colonial expansion. And so anti-colonial movements were on the rise worldwide. And uh, here on this slide, you see a map of Africa, which shows the years in which African countries became independent. It goes sort of from 1910 to the 1960s. This is known as the wind of change in Africa. What's interesting from a linguistic perspective is that the end of colonial rule did not diminish the importance of English as a global language. If anything, the opposite is true. In the aftermath of colonial rule, Britain adopted a change in governance strategy that created support for mass education in English. Again, the main motivation was not pure humanitarianism, but rather it was economic considerations. Through English as an international language of trade, contracts and symbolic political relations persist, which ultimately translate into economic advantages for the metropolis. The bottom line is that the English language stayed even though British colonial rule had ended. Now, when I say that English became an international language, that does not mean that international English developed as a general language variety that was spoken by everybody. Rather, more and more varieties of English become what Schneider in his dynamic model calls endonormatively oriented. That is, many world Englishes emerge, each with their conventionally established norms. In the last video, I presented the E-Wave, the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English, which documents many of these varieties. Two main factors are responsible for the post-colonial success of English. First of all, English is a tool for socioeconomic advancement. It is the ticket to participation in a global economy, if you like. Second, it is the tool for the emergence and the display of a local identity. Varieties that are endonormatively oriented are a vehicle for sovereignty. To come back to our earlier example of Malaysian English, Malaysian English is not in the first place a reminder of colonial rule. Rather, it is a reminder that colonial rule has been overcome. Yeah, that's an important difference. I want to come to the second part of this video in which I go over four different colony types and their linguistic consequences. The colonies are trade colonies, exploitation colonies, settlement colonies, and plantation colonies. Let's start with trade colonies, which, as the name implies, were set up for the purpose of exchanging goods. Trade colonies represent the start of the colonial enterprise, and initially, trade colonies have been established without a permanent co-presence of the trading parties. This means that the traders don't have a common language, but they have a need to communicate. And this results in a limited purpose lingua franca or a pidgin. Yeah? I'd like to take up one example here that is slightly unusual, but nonetheless interesting and useful to consider, namely the case of Rosenosk, which, as you might guess, is a trade language that combines elements of Russian and of Norwegian. It is no longer spoken, yeah, but it was spoken in the 18th and 19th century. What's unusual about this is the power symmetry between the two languages. More typically, colonial situations are characterized by clear power asymmetries, but not here. Here, Russian and Norwegian sailors met and exchanged goods and created this language in the process. Okay, power asymmetries are evident in exploitation colonies, which are exploited by the metropolis for economic benefit. The empire is represented by administrators and commercial agents, so the British East India Company would be a prime example of the latter. Um, linguistically, <clears throat> the language of the colonizers is introduced to a small indigenous elite who is then trained and involved in the governance of the colony. Access to English is access to power and that access is strategically withheld from the vast majority. Um, this strategy can be seen in this quotation by a British member of parliament of the time, Thomas Babington Macaulay. Uh, what he says is, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us 
and the millions we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinion, in morals, and in intellect. Now, the ideology that underlies quotations like this one is a profound dismissiveness of cultures that are not European. Um, I'll say more about this. Um, now, India, of course, is the most prominent example of a British exploitation colony with a 200 year history of British colonialism that started with the establishment of trading posts by the British East India Company and that ended in 1947 when India regained independence. Linguistically, exploitation colonies give rise to indigenized L2 varieties that I talked about in the last video. These varieties are introduced via education systems, and that's why they have a very clear exonormative orientation at first. They are modeled on a variety that is spoken in the metropolis. Yeah? So Indian English is modeled on British English, and speakers from the colonies are educated in British English. Some of them were sent to Britain and educated there, and as time went on, um, varieties of this type take on local characteristics and develop ultimately an endonormative orientation. Yeah? Okay, I'm moving on to settlement colonies, which have a very different linguistic outcome. Settlement colonies involve large-scale population relocations in which English ancestry people settle permanently in overseas areas. And what happens there is that the dialects of these speakers mix and blend into a new high contact L1 variety. In the last video, I gave the example of St. Helena English, Australian English and New Zealand English for that. Uh, there are other examples. Um, so one example that I can give you here would be Newfoundland English. Newfoundland was uh, claimed as the first British colony in 1583. And then we actually know quite a bit about the settlers from England and from Ireland who settled there. We know something about the sociolinguistic contexts. We know about the political history. So Newfoundland was self-governing from 1855 onward and formed a union with Canada in 1949. Right, um, let me move on to plantation colonies. I already said that plantation is a euphemism for the organized abduction and abuse of more than 10 million people from Africa. Many plantations were set up in the Caribbean for the large-scale production of agricultural products. The enslaved people had to acquire a form of English as spoken by several social groups of L1 speakers, including plantation owners, overseers, and, plantation and servants, all of which spoke different traditional L1 varieties. As I mentioned before, plantations represent the settings in which Creole languages develop. So speakers who don't share a common language and who only get very sporadic input from L1 speakers, they have to come up with a common tool of communication. I'll say more about pigeons and creoles in another video, so stay tuned for that. As an example of a plantation colony, I have chosen Barbados, whose colonial history started with the Portuguese and which was under British colonial rule for more than 300 years. Barbados is home to Bajan Creole, which is based on the grammars of West African substrat languages and which includes English lexical words. So English is the so-called lexifier of Bajan Creole. Right, so this completes the very brief overview of four different colony types and the kinds of language varieties that they give rise to. We'll get into more details of each of these colonies in the next videos. The bottom line for now, the most important insight is that different social settings produce different varieties of English. Postcolonial Englishes are different, and you might think that one reason for that is that, well, English has come into contact with very different languages that were spoken in all the different areas. So if English mixes with, let's say, Indonesian, sure, that will give a different result than English spoken with a West African language. Well, that is, of course, true. But as we will see in more detail in the next videos,
the social settings have produced profound consequences on the structures and characteristics that we find in the new varieties that are formed. So Creole languages, no matter where they are spoken, have a great deal in common. Okay, I'm coming to the last part of this video, the teaching of English in colonial settings. I've already mentioned Macaulay and the idea of using English as an instrument of power in colonial settings. There is an important book by Alistair Pennycook with the title The Cultural Politics of English as an International Language. In the next minutes, I'll discuss two or three ideas from that book that I find particularly important. Pennycook distinguishes two approaches that have been applied by the British, and he calls these approaches Orientalism and Anglicism. Um, both, of, both of these terms have other meanings in different contexts, so their use is a bit idiosyncratic here. Orientalism here means that the colonizers are educating the indigenous population in their local languages, and they're also educating the English administrators in those languages as well. Anglicism, on the other hand, means that the colonizers educate the indigenous population in English, and this would be in line with the position expressed by Macaulay that we've seen a minute ago. Right, now Pennycook observes that over time there is an ideological shift from Orientalism to Anglicism. However, this doesn't mean that the British colonizers have somehow seen the light and have adopted a humanitarian purpose here. Uh, Penny Cook presents arguments for the view that Orientalism and Anglicism are really two sides of the same colonialist ideology. So both teaching local languages and teaching English serve colonialist goals. They serve the purpose of oppression and domination rather than education. Yeah? And also both denying people knowledge of English and requiring knowledge of English serve as tools of oppression. Um, now, I've mentioned colonialist ideology before, but one aspect that I haven't touched on in a lot of detail is the so-called civilizing mission. Yeah? There's a French term, mission civilisatrice. Uh, and that would be the misguided idea that Europeans have the moral obligation to impose their culture on other cultures because that would be a benefit. The ideology is expressed in the quotation that you see on the slide, so I'll, I'll read this to you. Um, this knowledge will teach the natives of India the marvelous results of the employment of labor and capital, rouse them to emulate us in the development of the vast resources of their country, guide them in their efforts and gradually but certainly confer upon them all the advantages which accompany the healthy increase of wealth and commerce and at the same time secure to us a larger and more certain supply of many articles necessary for our manufacturers and extensively consumed by all classes of our population as well as an almost inexhaustible demand for the produce of British labor. Isn't that generous? It's heart melting, right? Okay. Um, in practical terms, all teaching efforts boil down to economic considerations, and the ideology is a post hoc rationalization of economic policy. So if we teach English to a small elite of local inhabitants, well, that facilitates colonial governance. And if we teach English to a larger segment of the population, well, that facilitates recruitment of a larger workforce with basic schooling. So in both cases, the purpose is economical rather than a moral imperative to educate. Let me come to an end. My aim for this video has been to sketch a few basic notions that we have to understand in order to come to terms with colonialism and its linguistic consequences. Colonial ideology, I hope to have shown, is not a thing of the past. Yeah? It's a legacy that we cannot allow ourselves to ignore. Because if we do, we become complicit in the injustices that persist to this day. Okay, so what can we do? I'd say, let's start at home. Let's educate ourselves. For example, why not find out more about Thilo Frey? Yeah, a link is in the description below. There's also a link that leads to more information about Louis Agassiz. I don't want his name on my university, but I certainly don't want him erased from history. We need to remember. Anyway, that's it for today. 
Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.